Yeah, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. I hope that, like, uh, last evening was not very hard for you. Uh, so today, today we will talk about plugins uh, with, uh, with Charles, who is a reverser at Sequoia, and me. Um, I like a threat intelligence analyst at uh, Sequoia 2. Uh, so the aim of this talk is to, to, to present you some technical challenge that we had regarding a sinkhole, and uh, it, it was uh, the, the sinkhole of the Plugix swarm. So I think that uh, regarding like the, the, the last day, most of you know uh, what is Plugix, so it's, uh, it's uh, like a typical rat with uh, Chinese roots. Uh, it's like the precursor. It's infamous for its DLL solid loading techniques and most of the like MSS, uh, Ministry of State Security and Truth and Set are like still using it. Uh, even after like 15 years of developments, variants, etc., etc., and you have like some leaked builder. And when I say that they are still using it, so maybe you have different threat actors that uh, are using it today, not only Chinese, uh, but today I, I was looking at the, uh, some data and census, and you have still 300 uh, server linked to plugins which are active nowadays. So after 15 years, it's quite impressive. And uh, that's all like for this slide. Um, and one day you have like uh, guys that had the bad idea to implement some warming component on plugins. So it's just a plugin with some codes that uh, allowing it to duplicate uh, from a flash drive to another computer to which will re, re effect flash drive, etc., etc. And we don't know why it has been developed because we don't have like the telemetry from the initial infection. So we don't know if it was only to bypass some air gaps on secure networks and exfiltrate documents or if it was just to propagate all around the world. Uh, but you will see that uh, the second case uh, was, was for them, I think, a successful operations or not. And, uh, and yeah, uh, most of like the security editors and when we are looking at the DLLs, et cetera, et cetera, we, we can link uh, at least a few samples of this swarm to Mustang Panda. And uh, so we, we think all only one C2. We know from the security industry, notably from Mondion, that they, they were also three other C2s. And uh, so like this talk will focus on one of them. Uh, so past research from on, on that, uh, you have like Sophos uh, that have, have been, I think, the first to publish on, on this thread, uh, followed by Mondion. And so Mondian say that it's one of the most cyber aggressive espionage operation because they, they see the worm almost everywhere. And Sophos just seeing the worm on few countries. Uh, but it's the Sophos article that it's the most interesting because like you have an IP address. And uh, one morning I, I was looking at this article um, and saying to me like, yeah, it can be a good technical challenge to take the ownership of this IP address because like at Sequoia, we have done some sinkholes, like on Raspberry Rubin or other botnets. Uh, but uh, sinkholing an IP address, we, we never did that before. Uh, so what's the recipe uh, to do that? But before, before the recipe, uh, why it, it's an interesting IP address? Just because when you see uh, the compilation that of uh, the, the DLL used, by, uh, used for side loading, it was uh, compilate, uh, compilated uh, on the 7th of July in 2020. And the last track from a trusted source, because it's like far in the past, uh, for the C2 when it was up was just one month later. So we don't know, for example, if like the operations was successful, uh, so the operators just abandoned their C2s or if they were only flowed by victims' data, so they abandoned their C2s too. And so nothing, nothing in 2021, 2022 on this IP, some services, but nothing uh, related to malicious C2 or something like that. And in 2023, uh, we, we tried to sync all this. So uh, to sync all it uh, with the, for the price of a beer, how to do that? So first, you do an end map on it. Uh, no service up, it doesn't respond to our ping probes, so the, the host seems, uh, seems down. So uh, I get my chat GPT because I'm not, uh, I'm not very uh, an English formal guy. 
uh, and just asking the hoster, like the abuse service that uh, most of the time don't respond to any request. And this time, like the guys responded in like 30 minutes. And I was just asking, okay, I can rent a, a VPS in your data center, but I, I want to uh, get this specific IP address because we want to sync or something. And the guys were, well, okay, let's do it. So thank you. And um, just like a few minutes later, so I, I got this uh, shell and uh, I, I saw my like, SSH connections very lagging, like it's, it was very slow. So I decided just to, to put a, a, a simple uh, Python web server on it. And I saw like a continuous flow of, of requests on it. So uh, these requests were like typical for plugin stuff. So for those who don't know how to recognize like HTTP requests from plugin, you have like there's three uh, four headers, sorry, uh, which are typical. So the key uh, can change, but the value for beaconing are not changing. Uh, so it's quite typical from like 15 years ago, it was the same. And it's begun on different ports with different protocol, but which is interesting is the HTTP for us. So how we did that? Uh, so we, we did just a chip sync call, uh, because when you, you are doing a, a sync call, uh, you, you don't control the request, and there were like a huge amount of requests. Uh, so we decided to, and we, we were on a specific data center, and we can't change the IP address of it. So uh, we had to deal with that, to uh, deal with the amount of requests, uh, the quota bandwidth, uh, or server, which was very, uh, very small. Uh, so how to handle such requests? Uh, it was first, whoop, first uh, you use uh, IP tables with rate limiting, so you can respond uh, because you will not uh, answer to all of the beaconing requests. Uh, you just want like one request to, to respond per minute per IP address source. So IP tables rate limiting uh, with uh, hash, hash module or something like that uh, is a very great, uh, very great uh, uh, way to do that. Uh, we are also checking because uh, we are looking for plugix requests and not scanning ones, uh, the right plugix headers. Uh, so it's just a small Python script that looks, uh, I, I don't remember it, if it was on Python or, or just Nginx, but we are looking to them, and uh, when it matches uh, the plugin request, we forward all the stuff to a chip backend too, uh, because we don't have money, uh, so it's like a, the same, like a $7 server uh, hosted uh, on like Digital Ocean. Uh, with uh, some MongoDB, Python, to have like, uh, you know, the world map of, uh, of the end fictions, some, uh, doing some uh, enrichment uh, calcul calculations, uh, like uh, first scene, last scene, like for passive DNS, but for sync calls, to see uh, if, for example, the, the, the plugin is uh, persistent inside the victim networks. And we also saw uh, many, like, uh, networks that has multiple end fiction in them, uh, just because like the, the proxy had the, the internal IP address, so you have many networks that are, have a lot of infected workstation. So after six months, uh, what we saw? Uh, we saw uh, more than one, uh, two million unique IP address from uh, 170 countries, so it's a lot. We have like almost all of the countries, not the Vatican, like the very small one, we, we don't have it. And uh, so um, there's, there's, um, there's, uh, there's a number are, uh, we, we don't, we, we can deduce something from this number just because you have many dynamic IP addressing. Uh, you have also uh, satellite providers and different providers that just uh, use unique IP uh, with a lot of su subscribers behind it. And like this one is mostly in Africa. So you, you have like a lot of telemetry issued by uh, US, for example, Starlink and uh, other countries, just because they have like satellite, uh, satellite teleport. But in one day, uh, the, the, the number is fluctuating from uh, 80 to uh, 100,000 uh, IP address, so it's more a reliable uh, number. So in terms of uh, victimology, you have like Nigeria, India, China, 
which is strange. I run Indonesia, Great Britain, Iraq, blah, 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 and uh, almost all of the countries. So it's like, it's not like a very big botnet, but after four years of activity, it's still quite uh, impressive to, to see that uh, in, uh, in, the, in the wild. So uh, the, the main aim was to deduce uh, why this swarm, uh, why it has been developed, uh, what was the objective of the threat actors behind it, and when you map all the things and you show it to a, like a geopolitical analyst, uh, it will say, okay, it's pretty sure that it's related to Chinese investment in the Africa. Uh, just because uh, you have like many countries with coastlines, uh, with a lot of investment in uh, railways, uh, ports, infrastructure investment, etc., etc., And you see, for example, you have the Panama, but it can be a sting, but after you have different straits that you see all of the countries are, are infected. You have Malacca, Baden Baden, uh, Suez, etc., etc. And so you, you can think, okay, maybe you, we are on the right track, maybe it's related to that. But it's very hard to say because like the Chinese are just investing everywhere, uh, even in Europe, and uh, Europe is not uh, very infected. And you have to remember that this swarm is like just four years old, so we had time to propagate almost everywhere in the world. So after that, uh, I said, well, okay, it's cool. Uh, we have some telemetry, but it, could, it can be also challenging stuff to, to look at. Can we disinfect remotely the workstation from this swarm? So we were also looking at the remote disinfection opportunities with Charles. Uh, so why disinfecting? Uh, first, uh, is the, this example is just a $7 uh, example. Uh, but like any cyber criminal or some advanced threat actor with interception capabilities or compromising the data center or, or anything can uh, get the ownership of this IP address. Uh, and uh, we, we were also thinking, okay, uh, we, we see uh, the US doing that, like disinfection, but without uh, asking the country if, if they want to be disinfected. So we came to our mind also to this uh, sovereign disinfection, camp uh, sovereign disinfection uh, stuff, uh, thinking about like giving to the LAI or the national certs, like the list of the IP address and the IS, uh, autonomous systems. And we asked them, okay, if, if you want, we can disinfect uh, like specific IS or IP address, just ask us and we will provide to you like an interface to do that. But the big question was how to achieve that. So, few initial questions that, so I came to Charles. Hey Charles, I have uh, something to you, for you. So first, it was like uh, the PlugX uh, communication, how they work, uh, there is some encryption, it can, can it be breaked or not? Uh, if we have the, the, the workstation compromised uh, like uh, PlugX, uh, those plug plugins have like some uh, some command to to disinfect the workstation, or do we have to develop some uh, script for that? And the last one was okay. Uh, can the workstation and the infected USB drive can be uh, can be uh, disinfected or not? So I let Charles to to present his uh, his discoveries. Yes. Hello, uh, thanks, Felix. So, um, to answer this, uh, this question, I need to, to start by giving a brief uh, overview of, of PlugX. So, this is uh, my uh, infected uh, USB key. Uh, as you can see, you have a, a shortcut on the root of the USB key. Uh, this is quite usual for, for USB worm. And uh, the purpose of this uh, shortcut is to force the, the user to click on it and to execute uh, something to, to access its data. Uh, but this is uh, what the user sees, and this is the reality. So you have uh, some uh, hidden uh, directory. So the first one is um, you don't see the name of the directory because uh, this is a space character. And uh, it contains, or it will contain, the legitimate uh, data of the of the USB key. The second uh, directory is uh, recycler.bin. 
So this masquerades as a, as a trash, but this is not this is not the trash. Uh, it contains uh, plug-ex binaries and uh, and some staged data. So when uh, the user click on the on the shortcut, uh, plug-ex uh, will be executed, as you can see here. So we can see the DLI side loading. So once uh, plug-ex is executed from the from the USB key. So uh, it, re it redirects uh, the it redirects the user to the to the first hidden uh, directory. So the user will see uh, its legitimate files, and after plugix will copy it save to the to the workstation. Then it adds persistence. So it creates a service, uh, add a registry key, and then it restarts it uh, restarts it save uh, from the workstation. So now your workstation is uh, is infected. And uh, Plugix start to communicate with uh, with a C2, and he, he awaits command. Then he auto automatically infect all the all the flash drives. So when we plug a flash drive, a uh, few seconds after it will be uh, infected. And then uh, yes, it copy uh, certain files to to a hidden directory. So if you have um, if you are not connected to internet and you have a PPTX or something like that in your home directory. This file will be copied in the in the second directory, so the, the trash, and uh, so this is for uh, air gap uh, functionality. So now regarding the um, the communication, so this uh, variant of uh, Plugix use, um, uses uh, HTTP or, TL, or TCP, and um, and the commands are very very simple. So you have a header and a payload. So the header is uh, is represented here. So you have the command ID. Uh, you have also the size of the payload. So you have two sizes because uh, the payload could, uh, the payload uh, is is sometimes uh, is encrypted, and then uh, the algorithm is RC RC4, and the key is uh, the concatenation of two parts. The first part is uh, hard coded on the sample, and uh, the second part is uh, set up by the by the C2 server, so we know the first part, we control the second part, so we can communicate with the, with the C2 server, with the workstation. So it is important to note this, so we don't have uh, public key cryptography or certificate pinning or something like that, so it's easy to, to interact with, uh, with the workstation. So now we can think about uh, strategy to, to disinfect the uh, workstation, so we have two strategies. The first one is to use a save nation uh, command. So here you have the, the list of the command, and the last one is uh, interesting, so the 1005, because uh, it retrieves uh, the directory of uh, plugix, the service name, and, and uh, it deletes uh, all of this. So this is the uh, auto delete command, and we can try to, to send it. So here is a, is a capture of, uh, of our um, communication. You can see the k suffix encrypted leader and, uh, and the payload. Alors, here, we don't have to, we have nothing in the payload, but we have to send the payload to have a, a valid command. And uh, we send it, and uh, yes, it works. So we can disinfect the workstation with this, uh, with this payload, so it's good, but <laughs> yes, it's good. And uh, in, uh, only one HTTP only one HTTP response is um, is sufficient to to disinfect workstation. And uh, another thing is that we can use the same HTTP response for all uh, workstation because we don't have a change response uh, in this process. So we can use the same HTTP response uh, for all workstation. So it's very efficient. Yes, but we have a problem here, is that uh, we can't uh, disinfect the flash drives in this case. So we need to a second uh, strategy. So the second strategy is to send the disinfection payload. So we have to implement our own payload, send the payload to the, to the workstation and, um, and run it. Uh, to do that, we have to, to implement it. So we have to disinfect the workstation, but also the, the USB key. To do that, we have to remove some, some data and modify the structure of the, of the USB key. So it's a little more complicated, but uh, it is not so complicated because we have reversed all the plugix uh, malware. So we can just copy, 
copy past uh, lots of code, lots of code of Pregix because um, Pregix has the same uh, functionality. So here is an example. So here is a, is a code of Pregix from IDEA Pro. And I rename of the thing. I put command to to explain what uh, what, he, what it does. And uh, this is the code of my payload. So I copy past all the thing, even the, the commands. So this part of the code is used to to check if the uh, connected device is a USB key or not. So now we have our payload. Uh, we can try to send it. To do that, we have to send some uh, some commands. So the first one is to create a new listening thread. So this command is used to to um, to create a thread, and this thread is uh, waiting for uh, a sequence of command. And then we can send this sequence of command. So the first one is to expand an environment variable. So here the temp directory. So this is used to. We use it to, in order to, to have a path to, to upload uh, our payload. And then we have some usual command. So create file, what file, close file, and create process. And then yes, we can try it, and then it works. So here, yeah, we, we need six uh, HTTP response to disinfect uh, the workstation and the flash drive. But uh, we have some limitation. Uh, here the, we don't want to, to add a persistence uh, mechanism to, uh, to our payload because we don't want to, repla to replace a worm by uh, another worm or another botnet or I don't know. But we don't want to add persistence uh, to, our, to our payload. So the infected flash drive have to be plugged in when we, when we run the payload. Um, yes, we have this first imitation, and the second imitation is that um, this strategy is very intrusive because, well, yes, we re we move the <laughs> we modify the directory tree, we remove stage data. So if we do something wrong, uh, yes, it's very com complicated to to change uh, the things. So it's very intrusive. We need to be very careful uh, when we when we did that when we do that. So yeah, uh, some lessons learned from this uh, this case. So it was a fun, fun technical challenge, especially for Charles, who has to reverse all the things. <laughs> so, uh, but like the propagation mechanism uh, renders it almost impossible to disinfect just because like a uh, plug swarm can be dormant, can sleep on a USB key for years before being plugged it on a computer. Uh, the seventh solar method, uh, we use that on other cases, like the dossier, and it worked also with different hosters. So it can be very interesting for you if you have like just IP address as C2s, and uh, you don't have like any contact with law enforcement or I don't know. Or if you are doing bug bounty, you know, uh, you, you can, uh, you have like subdomain takeover, you can have IP now takeover. And uh, this example illustrates also that, like any botnet, can be re reused. Uh, I, I remember that, like uh, a Mandiant blog post about Torla reusing, I don't remember what malware, uh, to infect some Ukrainian computers. And uh, it's something that we had to consider, like dead botnets are not necessar necessarily dead, even like more if it's worms. So, we still have unanswered uh, questions. So, the motivation of this worm, we don't know. We don't know even like if it has like multiple patient zero because it was starting like uh, its date back like four years ago. So, uh, we don't know like the, the first patient zero. We don't know if it was like USB key in uh, specific countries or if it was like, a, I don't know what conference where uh, guys uh, get some infected USB keys. And uh, uh, when I, I spoke also regarding like this 4C2, we, we know that one of the C2 was also maybe called, but we don't know by who. And uh, so it's very strange because like the guys used netisim, uh, inetsim, sorry, which is like uh, stuff for reversing calls locally. And uh, we, we saw it on, on one of the C2 with like maximum connection exceeded, which was like 30 connection. Um, so we, we, 
uh, thing that someone also trying to sinkhole it, but we don't know, uh, apparently not publicly. So that's for all questions. Maybe you have some questions to ask us. So don't, do not hesitate. Thank you. Okay, questions. Yes. Hi, thank you for the, the great talk. Uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, the, the first part is um, the, the uh, running the disinfection code is, is a great thought experiment, but did you actually go through with it and, and actually run it? Uh, and uh, the second part is, if you did, how did you ensure that you, you confined uh, your, your uh, execution to specific countries where, where you had uh, collaboration with uh, law enforcement for, do, for doing this? Okay, so we, we never like interacted with infected workstation. We want some authorization for that. <laughs> so we, we are like cooperating with some LEAs, which are interesting by that, by the concept, but uh, it takes time. And regarding like uh, the, the country, yeah, it's like IP geolocalization. So uh, it's, it's why we also don't want disinfect one country, but like specific autonomous systems, because we know that, for example, in France, you have OVH, and you have a lot of like VPN server that exists on the OVH. So if we send disinfection uh, response to them, maybe, I, I don't know where they, they are, but maybe all around the world and not in France. So maybe it can be good for, I don't know, university uh, autonomous systems or governmental ones. Uh, so yeah, it was a fun challenge. We don't still uh, send disinfection uh, answers. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, have you found any effective way? Well, are you? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too close. Um, have you found any effective way of tracking? Uh, the number of new infections, because as you mentioned, the botnets can be active for a very long period of time, so it's difficult to tell if a computer was infected three years ago or yesterday, and especially with the use of like flash drives and things going down. Um, is, were there any interesting metrics you could find in terms of like how many new people it's infecting versus things already on the network? Yeah, it's very difficult to, to, to know that just because like we don't have like specific UID regarding the workstation or any uh, identifier in the prefix request. So yeah, uh, I, I know that uh, we are like, um, every day we see on this one hundred thousand IP address like as new IP address, I, I don't remember well, but it's, it's 12,000. So maybe you have like a big part of it, which is like still infected since uh, many days, years, weeks, I, I don't know. Other questions? Thank you for the talk. Do you have any statistics on how many actual infections uh, there were? Not the IP addresses, but the actual like implants running on machines, because some of those IP addresses will be the same uh, implants that are just routed differently over the internet. Yeah, it's the same issue. With, uh, we don't have like a very specific ID to differentiate one, stage, one workstation to another. Um, but we, what we see, and uh, I, I uh, talk about it during the talk uh, was that uh, we, we see um, networks with multiple uh, workstation infected uh, because we have their internal IP address in the headers like x4 forwarded 4 and we, we know also with the beaconing because we we are ta <laughs> now it's too complicated let's uh, speak about that <laughs> around the beer if you want but it, it was like we, we were monitoring the beaconing and we saw like IP address that are beaconing very much and we, we are pretty sure that there were like a lot of workstation 
a compromise behind it. It was mostly the, the case of China, for example. I think that they have a lot of mobile subscriber or something like that that exit just by one IP address, and they have like a number of it, which is very uh, amazing. But yeah, it's very difficult to, to answer to that question. Okay, last question. Um, did you guys have any other researchers contact you that, that were saying like, hey, what are you guys doing? You're deleting my malware that I'm researching and things like this? We are in your cave, so no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, uh, really it, it was a, a research that we shared with LEA and some national certs but uh, not like the, the, the community at this time. So uh, maybe after, yeah, you have a blog post, we have Twitters too, so don't, do not hesitate to contact us to share your, your findings on it. And if like this guy that has like this, uh, this sinkhole uh, is in the room, uh, I will be glad, glad to speak to him or her because uh, yeah, it's very interesting. Okay, thank you very much.